Hi, this is Le Cong from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard and the McGovern Institute for Brain Research at MIT. Today I would like to introduce to you the genome engineering technology with CRISPR and its application. The CRISPR technology uh, is one of the genome engineering technologies that we have talked about earlier in the introduction. And um, as we mentioned earlier, there are two existing technologies that already can perform genome manuring in the field, which is zinc finger protein technology and transcription activator like defectors technology. However, these two technologies have some difficulties. First is cost. It usually costs more than five thousand per pair of you know uh, of, do of money to buy a commercial zinc finger nucleus or talons. It is much more expensive when you want to directly order a cell line or animal. The second is reliability issue. Zinc finger and tail technology sometimes have issues with off-target activity, and it's uncertain whether we can further improve the two technology platform to address this issue. And lastly, and per perhaps most critically, is the long turnover time and the difficulty to scale up for these two technologies. So for performing large-scale genome engineering uh, in accordance with the accumulation of big data biology and also the plenty of genomic uh, sequencing uh, and other biological knowledge that we we'll like, we'll have accumulated in the past years, we really would like to have some technology that really enables high-throughput genome engineering. And CRISPR might be one of the technology that enables this type of application. CRISPR is cluster regular interspace short palindromic repeats. It's a local that encodes a bacterial, a uh, microbial adaptive immune system. So, uh, to summarize how the system works, the CRISPR uh, actually uh, has two different processes. First, uh, there is a phage infection happens. Uh, in the bacteria, and then the CRISPR system and its associated protein called Cas proteins uh, will be able to take some of these phage invading phage DNA or plasmid DNA and incorporate them into the genomic locus of the CRISPR system, so that it forms, as you can see here on the top in the panel A, a series of uh, repetitive palindromic structure shown here in this colored block. So if the colored block is a feature or sequence from the invading fatal plasma DNA remembered by the CRISPR system, and then it is sandwiched by a white part, which is a universal repeat sequence of the CRISPR system. And then the CRISPR expresses these, uh, a non-coding Precursor RNA called precursor CRISPR RNA, CRNA, from this loci. And with Cas proteins and some cellular proteins, it will process this precursor into individual units. And each of the units will recognize through RNA DNA based RNA a target invading phage or plasma DNA that it has remembered, as shown here in panel C. And then the effector complex, usually comprised of different Cas proteins will be able to load this non-coding RNA and guided by this RNA to recognize the invading phage or plasma DNA feature. And then the protein complex, or the protein, will cleave the target DNA, uh, introducing a double strand break, as shown here in the bottom. And in bacteria, this will block the infection. And we can imagine in mammalian cells, we can use the system We'll be able to introduce double stranded break into the mammalian genome using the system in a similar fashion. And a series of work from the 1980s to now have defined how the system works and also the, each of the components that is required for performing the CRISPR's function. And specifically, we're more interested in the part where it cleaves target, or what we call the interference part. So, there are three types of different CRISPR systems, and uh, we have 
been able to utilize one of the simplest and most well understood CRISPR systems uh, called type 2 CRISPR system. And this is uh, the example of type 2 CRISPR system from bacteria S. progenies, CRISPR lotus 1. This CRISPR lotus is a classic type 2 CRISPR system, which it has a tracer RNA, a Cas9 protein, a series of Cas proteins, and also uh, the non coding RNA part called cRNA, as we mentioned earlier. So, from the, um, this locus, the pre cRNA are five, and then processed and loaded onto a single protein called Cas9. And then this Cas9, guided by the RNA, will basically recognize specific targets and then introduce a double strand break completing the interference part of the CRISPR system. And into more detail, we can imagine to design the system from one use by basically switching the this blue colored targeting part from the RNA with a sequence that matches human genome, or what we call a guide sequence of about 20 base pairs. And then this CRISPR RNA with the new guide will be recognized and bound by the tracer RNA, or what we call a transactivating RNA, serving as a helper. And these two RNA complexes will be processed into this form and then loaded onto Cas9 protein, the single Cas protein that is required for performance interference. And then this complex will recognize the specific genomic targets that have perfect base pattern with the guide RNA. And then uh, through a very clever self versus non-self recognizing system called proto-spacer adjacent motif or PAM sequence, the CAS will be able to introduce a specific cleavage about three base pair upstream of the PAM. And in this case, for the pyogenes CRISPR system, the PAM sequence is NGG, meaning that only when you have this NGG motif downstream of a spacer sequence or the guide sequence, will the CRISPR system be able to cleave the target so that it will only cleave the target that's present in the genome. So in our earlier work, we try to reconstitute this entire CRISPR system in mammalian cells and define the minimal CRISPR system that have full function to introduce double-centered break in the mammalian genome. So here, we are using different constructs to express the four different uh, components of the CRISPR system. Uh, the Cas9 protein, the RNA3, which uh, was thought to be involved in processing, the CRISPR RNA, which we have here designed, to recognize a sequence within the human EMX1 gene. Then the tracer RNA, which is the helper. You can see at the bottom the design of the spacer. So when we try different combinations of the system, we have uh, actually figured out that uh, the only required components for performing CRISPR function is the Cas9, the tracer RNA, and the CRISPR RNA. And on the left is the job showing the results. You can see from the last two lanes that the RNA3 is not required because both have efficient genome cleavage. And our cleavage was measured by an assay that specifically recognized uh, indels or mismatch within the genome amplified product called severe nucleus assay as demonstrated in the right. And uh, to simplify the system, people have actually developed a simple version of uh, this RNA part of the of the CRISPR Cas engineering tool, where they fuse the tracer helper RNA into the guide RNA, as shown here in this figure, and then the single RNA will guide the Cas9 protein to target locus and perform the cleavage activity. Uh, and this chimeric RNA, uh, as we call it, uh, is you know spearheaded by two different labs uh, in uh, where they basically designed a series of constructs to test 
the effectiveness of the camera can, right, and show that it works well in vitro. And we have previously tested in vivo, where we showed that it seems camera can also works in cells as shown on this page in the figure, but doesn't seem to be very efficient. However, later, uh, through my, uh, the work of my colleagues in the lab, they have defined uh, basically the efficiency of the chimeric RNA could be very high or even higher than the, the natural design when you have the full length of the help RNA. So we were using a shorter version of the tracer help RNA that doesn't support efficient editing. But now when you extend the tracer RNA to its full length and use the chimeric RNA anchor with the long tracer RNA, the cleavage efficiency as shown in, in the bottom is very good, sometimes approaching over 50% of modification. And moreover, when we compare the CRISPR cleavage activity with the tail activity, as shown here, when we target basically the same genomic locus with either tail lens, tail nucleases, or CRISPR, we can show that consistently CRISPR works better than tail lens. So we think CRISPR really exemplifies a very powerful, easily easy designed genome engineering tools that are very robust and highly efficient. And some interesting applications then, when you have the CRISPR system in hand, is you can introduce, as we mentioned earlier, homology recombination or homology directed repair will supply a template. As shown here, using templates such as single-stranded oligos, we can have efficient recombination as measured by this RFLP, restriction digestion test, in both HEC cells and human ER cells. And additionally, when you have multiple targets delivered into the same cell, you can also introduce deletions into the gene uh, through targeting the same gene with two adjacent space, uh, tar target spacers, as shown here in this figure, which reduce a very precise deletion within the gene EMX1. And lastly, because CRISPR um, have two nucleus domains, and we can actually inactivate nucleus domains without affecting its DNA binding capacity, we can use CRISPR as a general DNA anchor. Shown here is the two nucleus domains and the mutations that can inactivate both domains. And then we'll have the catalytically inert Cas9 protein. Uh, we can actually use it as a DNA anchor to anchor different effectors of the genome to perform transcription modulation and other epigenetic changes. So here is a work from my colleague that demonstrates the activation of human KL4 gene using a CRISPR transcription uh, effector. So overall, um, the CRISPR system is very powerful. And to make the system more exciting, uh, many different CRISPR loci exist in nature. And we have tested another loci from this bacteria Streptococcus thermophilus. It shows that it has a very robust cutting, similar to what we did with S. pyogenes. So we can, in the future, explore the diversity of CRISPR-Cas systems for further improvements of the system. At the end, I will compare different gene engineering technologies in this chart. As you can see, the recombinates, like Cree and Flip, is very precise and extremely efficient but it's very hard to design and very hard to multiply. Whereas zinc finger proteins and tails, even though they're very fairly easy to design, but they are very limited in terms of the multiplexing power of scalability, and also, uh, especially for zinc finger, to design a very good uh, protein, it requires some expertise. But in terms of CRISPR, CAS system, this system is very easy to design and to implement because it just relies on a change of a single guide RNA molecule. And for the same reason, it is very scalable, can be multiplexed in mammalian systems very easily through expressing, for example, multiple guide RNA in the same cell. Overall, we think genome engineering has really been improving in the past years. Uh, and we have seen a lot of exciting papers from both the previous zinc finger and tail technology and also more recently the CRISPR-Cas technology.
the overall we believe in the future, these disruptive technologies for gene engineering will enable us to perturb the genomic uh, and abgenomic contents of a cell or an organism with very good efficiency and scalability. When we integrate these technology into biological and medicine research, it will enable a broad application in complex disease modeling, therapeutics, or other biotechnology applications. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you need further information, you can either visit Adjin or visit our lab's website at 3w.genomeengineering.org. Thank you very much.